A very warm welcome to all of you. We are very excited to start with you jointly the first lecture of our third lecture series and to continue our journey of getting the best available knowledge on planetary health uh, to us, to all of you, to then be equipped to work as change agent, because it has been the motto from our first lecture series to move from knowledge to transformative action. I think all of you are, avail uh, are aware of how much uh, kind of we need to move forward with action. Uh, it is a very special year. It's also a very, very special phase in this year. Uh, I think you're aware about the uh, uh, decision of the highest court uh, of our constitution um, and uh, pointing out that the uh, climate law we, uh, the government had uh, presented and decided one and a half years ago is not sufficient. It's not ambitious enough. It's not specific enough. And uh, they are in a hectic process now of rewriting the climate law to be much more ambitious. So I think we are seeing that it is not any longer a question that we need to move to climate neutrality very fast. It is now a question of what are specific plans, top down, bottom up from all sides to make it as fast as possible the journey we need to kind of do in the next phase. So we are very, very happy to have you all here. Um, and uh, we especially are happy to have Julia Ponkratz from the University of Munich and Chris Murray from uh, the Gambia joining us today for giving their lectures. Um, before we go there, just a few uh, announcements on the uh, process of accreditation. Sophie, can you perhaps uh, just say a few words on the accreditation? Sure. Uh, hello, warm welcome from me as well. So your um, attendance is automatically registered from Zoom when you are, when you are logging in. So there's no need to do something uh, specific to do that. Zoom will record whether you're here or not. And you will be issued a, a certificate of attendance if you attend at least seven out of the eight lectures we have. However, we the process of accreditation with the university um, is handled with each institution or university, so you have you will have to contact them. Uh, we don't have any say in that. Uh, additionally to that, some of you will want to register for continuous medical education. This is a separate process and you not only have to register for the lecture, but also on a different form on our website and um, Hannah will put it in the chat so that you know where to go. Thank you very much, Sophie. Sophie is the co-moderator today, and I forgot to introduce myself. I'm so excited about the starting of the new uh, lecture series that I forgot to introduce myself. So my name is Martin Herrmann. I'm the chair of the German Alliance Climate Change and Health and one of the initiators of this Planetary Health lecture series. Um, and uh, I'm welcoming all the, the uh, participants who have been here before in the lectures who have uh, before, but also we are expecting a, a lot of new participants. So very warm welcome to you. And we are happy, very happy with you to go through these eight lectures. We have very interesting lectures coming up. The next one will be focusing on planetary health. Uh, then there will be ones on land use, on kind of uh, health for future, of having an idea of a good and healthy life for the future. We will have two uh, lectures on uh, clinical uh, disciplines, like internal medicine, geriatrics, psychiatry, um, aller uh, allergies, and so on and so forth. And uh, we will again have uh, at the end of the lecture series one lecture on examples of transformative action. So for everyone of you who is setting up a project in the next months and wanting to kind of demonstrate what you have developed, this is a chance to also for you to join in for the last lecture. And uh, now I move over to Julia Ponkratz to introduce her. Julia is a full professor for physical geography and land use system at the LMU in Munich. After her studies of ge geography, you investigated um, land use change as a climate driver throughout the last millennium during your PhD work. After a postdoc at Carnegie Institution Department of Global Ecology in Stanford, looking into food security and geoengineering, you established a junior research group at the Max Planck Institute for Meteorology 
on forest management in the earth system. You contribute to the EPCC last and also current assessment reports. You seek to connect disciplines and serve as a member of several interdisciplinary boards, amongst others, the steering committee of the German Alliance for Global Health Research. Very interesting how you're connecting many fields. Now I have a question uh, before you then start with your lecture to you, which is when did you first come about the concept of planetary health and what is your own perspective of what we are trying to jointly do? So thanks um, a lot first for, for inviting me to speak here. So this is really a great opportunity for, for me. Um, so I guess I, I got intrigued um, when I was finishing high school that climate change suddenly um, appeared in, in the media regularly. And it seemed to be such a massive problem for, for mankind, for all the ecosystems, for life on, on Earth in, in total. And, and it's, it occurred to me that um, since it's obvious it's such a big problem and nobody's doing something about it, clearly there must be no more research needed. And so I thought this is my chance to make a change and go into research. Only finding out 10 years later that it's not really about the lack of knowledge that doesn't make us act, but it's, that it's really about how we communicate the science and how we bring together all these complex interests into action. And this is also why I'm so delighted to be in such a um, field as, as your, your academy. So we're very much looking forward to your lecture, Julia. Over to you. Thanks. Um, I can share my screen, I guess. Yes. OK, excellent. So what, what I would like to um, speak a bit about is um, my, my special interest in planetary health. And that's related to how climate and ecosystems interact. And because it's uh, planetary health is, is important because also we humans need, um, the ecosystem services need to be in a stable climate um, to live well, live, continue living the life we, we are used to. I'm focusing in particular on this interface of climate and the land surface and the ecosystems. And this interface is shaped by land use. So land use can take all kinds of forms. You see here, an example, we, we cleared natural forests that would have grown in, in these regions. And then we put agricultural fields there. These agricultural fields may be managed in a different way. So you can clearly see different colors. So probably it's a different type of crop or maybe one is fertilized better than the other. So all these different things, that's land use. And land use, this is what I would like to, share, to show to you today. Um, is severely affecting climate, but is also giving us really a head start into how we could tackle the climate change issue. And so the story I'd like to um, convey today is, is basically three parts. And the first is I'd, I'd like to show you that humans change the Earth's vegetation cover immensely. And this alters climate in complex ways. There's two aspects I would like to discuss here. The first one is dealing with the global perspective on which we have to um, act when we speak in, in terms of mitigating global climate change. There, the most important feature about land use is that it increases global warming because of greenhouse gas emissions. The second aspect, however, is dealing with the local perspective. We may be able to alter climate very locally, and this would then mean that we can adapt to global warming because locally we can change the climate to a um, certain degree. And that's also a strength of, of land use. And then the outlook is that there's really new challenges lying ahead because we need to decrease emissions and we need to increase CO2 uptake by vegetation if we um, want to stand a chance that we reach these climate goals that Martin Hermann outlined in the introduction. And it's urgent that we, that we meet these climate goals. Um, the the um, World Meteorological Organization, together with Copernicus, they always put out um, the state of the global climate each year again. And if you look at the at last year, um, it's again one of the warmest on record. So this is what um, the global data tells us. Um, so it's really observational data, and we found that 20 oh, they found that 2020 um, the global mean surface temperature was 1.2 degrees warmer than the pre-industrial baseline. And um, even though it was a La Nina condition, that's, you know, there's, there's um, certain circulation patterns that change on a, 
um, um, multi-annual basis, El Nino, La Nina. La Nina would mean that the land surface, the ocean surface should be cooler than normal. 2020 was a La Nina year. And yet 2020, despite these natural background that should make it cool, made it one of the warmest three years on record ever since we started recording climate. And this to, contributed also to that the last decade um, is the warmest decade on record. So it was one of the warmest three years on record. It was virtually, um, they had the similar temperatures like 2016, 2019, which were the other two very hot years. So clearly the climate is changing and this has severe consequences for us directly, for us humans. Um, so you can also anticipate here, you see that we had um, five degrees anomaly in certain regions and we all know how this is affecting labor productivity, how this is affecting um, the chance for heat strokes and all these other medical issues very directly. But there's also more indirect effects of, of climate change. One goes via food security. And here, so I'm, I'm, I'm living in Germany, um, we have a very European perspective and there was a lot of interesting science we could do in Europe in terms of, of food and climate just in the last few years. Because we've had um, every, every few years we had a severe drought in Europe. Now we had basically three consecutive years of, of drought in, in Germany, for example. Large parts of Germany are, are suffering um, severely. Nothing compared, of course, to, to other parts of the world, but for, for Germany, who's not really used to having several years of drought after another, it's, it's really um, a major concern to the agricultural um, industry and to farmers themselves. So what you see here is, is one example of 2018, a very severe drought. You see a drought index shown here when it's below minus one, which is um, the case in all these regions, um, you see that there's a severe drought going on. So that was um, happening in 2018 in summer in Europe. And this is the effect of this very warm, very dry summer on the net CO2 uptake of the land surface. So this is important in one respect because CO2 of course is a climate driver, but it's also um, important in the other respect because CO2 uptake is what's needed to grow plants that are food in the end. And so here you clearly see that we had, um, I can just tell you, so these are massive decreases in plant productivity that we are seeing here in Germany and, and France during these summer drought events. And what was particularly bad about that year was that there was also a very warm spring. It wasn't particularly dry, but the spring was warm and this made plant vegetation or all the vegetation start um, growing quicker, meaning plants um, transpired water much earlier in the season, four weeks earlier than usual. And then this caused the plants to run out of water in summer even more. You see here just the effect of the warm spring on the summer CO2 uptake. You see again a massive decrease. So this was even enhanced then by the warm spring. And warm springs will increase under climate change. They will be enhancing summer droughts even more. And to put that in numbers, in Germany alone, farmers were compensated by with 340 million euros just for that one year. So a massive problem on, in, in this respect um, concerning food um, and climate change, of course. And that's just one aspect of why the um, global community came together in 2015 and said, there's clearly something we need to do about it. We need to be more ambitious than we used to be with the Kyoto Protocol, for example. And the Paris Agreement came about. And the Paris Agreement um, stated that we need to limit global warming to two degrees over pre-industrial level, ideally to 1.5 degrees. And this is over pre-industrial level. If you've seen before, if you remember what I told you about 2020, 2020 was 1.2 degrees warmer um, than pre-industrial. It was a particularly warm year. So if you take a bit of an average, we're one, one degree above pre-industrial baseline, but we would like to limit warming to 1.5 or two degrees over pre-industrial, meaning over today, that's just half a degree or one degree more. So a massive endeavor, but why? Well, because we want to avoid dangerous climate change, which comprises a whole lot of different aspects. For example, the issue of food that I was just speaking about, the issue of extreme events uh, with impact on, on human health. What do I have to do to get down to um, 1.5 degree or two degrees? Well, um, clearly we have to reduce emissions. That's the most important thing. You see here the emissions um, from anthropogenic activities, which is industry, electricity, heating, transport, but also land use change. And these emissions have increased um, since the beginning of the industrial era in the um, early 19th century. 
to about 10 petagrams carbon per year. And then how they will evolve in the future by the end of the century depends a whole lot on how we humans depend, how policy decisions are taken, how socioeconomics evolves. It may be that we stop emissions. It may be that we triple emissions. Um, it's still in our hands. The current trajectory um, is somewhere that we would end up here. And in terms of surface warming, this is what it would look like. So here you see the same type of, of um, scale, the last 100 years, the future 100 years. You see how, um, how the global surface temperatures have increased by one degree already. And then if we continue our actions as we currently do, we'll end up with something like um, one and a half or two degrees over present. So a degree too much over what we promised in the Paris Agreement. There's a big span here. So the current trajectory depends on whether you believe that those things that have been promised will be achieved. So will Germany really become carbon neutral or, or climate neutral before 2050, as we now said we would? Currently, the actions are not speaking in favor of that. So the promises are bigger than the actions. And this is the same case in many regions of the world. And therefore, there's a big span of what we can achieve. Um, either we stick to our actions currently, then we're coming up out at the higher end, or if you're really st um, staying with our pledges, we come get out here at the lower end, but we're still not where the Paris Agreement wants us. The pledges globally are still too low, too, too not strong enough to get us down to the Paris Agreement with 1.5 or two degrees. So how do we go get down there to the Paris Agreement? There are just various different ways that all um, culminate in the same key points. And this is why I show you a very, um, very schematic um, figure of how to get down to the Paris Agreement. Um, this figure shows you the CO2 emissions. We've just said we, we're currently at about 10 petagrams carbon per year that we are emitting. And um, so this is present day here, and we're going to 2100. Land use emissions make up um, about, in terms of CO2, this is CO2 only, so they make up about um, 1.5 petagrams carbon per year. And we, if we add fossil fuels, that's a major chunk, we get to what I will call here, for the purposes of this talk, the net emissions from anthropogenic activity. And we know from climate modeling, um, we can infer that, that to reach a 1.5 degree target, we need to have these net emissions become negative by the middle of the century. So 10,000 years now we've um, caused emissions that were positive emissions into the atmosphere. Now suddenly we want to get CO2 out of the atmosphere. That's negative emissions. How do we get there? Well, well, quite basically, we need to stop deforestation to eliminate this part of the emissions. And we really need to strongly decrease the fossil fuel emissions. So we need to mitigate, reduce emissions as much as possible. But it may not be possible entirely, right? So long haul um, air traffic, you cannot get on batteries anytime soon. So there will always be residual emissions here. What do we do about those? Well, if we can't get away with these emissions, we need additional sinks to get to net zero and then negative after. So we need active CO2 removal from the atmosphere. And this is where we put our hopes on land use change. For example, reforestation or afforestation. If we add that, we suddenly get a CO2 sink, restoring CO2 from the atmosphere inland. But it's not, get, not enough. We need more. We're still not at negative, not at zero here. So what we do is we do some fancy new types of land use. Bioenergy with carbon capture and storage, BECS, is something that's very popular. We do it small scale already. We grow these massive plants. We burn it instead of fossil fuel. Uh, we take the CO2 out of the chimneys of where we burn it and bury the CO2 in geological reservoirs or somewhere else. And then this would mean that we really suck up CO2 from the atmosphere, and then we would achieve the, the goal of becoming um, net zero in 2050 and have negative emissions afterwards. This is the scheme. There's different um, archetypes of emission scenarios, how we can um, implement that. These are all reaching 1.5 degrees here, but um, this first scenario, that doesn't need BECS, for example, because this is one where uh, models assume there's really a substantially reduced energy demands through innovations. If we don't do that, well, um, we, we can still go to a path of sustainability and strong international collaboration. This would also bring down um, the energy demand if we collaborate better across the world. If we don't do that, if we keep up um, our high energy demand, well, then we need to decarbonize our energy system. So if we stay with the historical patterns of our consumption, we need to decarbonize. 
And um, if we keep our economic growth and globalization as the main aim, then we will not achieve 1.5 degrees, even though we um, create massive things that will just be too late to many emissions before. And so for these, um, these types here, where we're not willing to decrease our energy demand, the world will look like, some, um, like this. Well, first, we need to decarbonize by um, massive increase in nuclear energy. Globally, this would mean something like five times more nuclear energy than we currently have. And additionally, to decarbonize the um, system, we need to plant bioenergy plantations wherever we can on three to seven million square kilometers. Just as a comparison, today's cropland is 15 million square kilometers. So something like a fifth or half of that additionally on top on the land to create these bioenergy plantations um, if you're not reducing the energy demand. So there's enormous pressure on the land ecosystems. Historically, there was substantial greenhouse gas emissions due to the need for food and fiber. And in the future, our hope is on land and land use because we um, aim at getting large scale carbon dioxide removal, for example, by these biomass plantations. And now I'd like to show you a bit these historical aspects and then just as an outlook, these large scale CDR methods. So first, where do we stand today? Well, this is the forest cover the, as, would, as it would exist in the absence of human interference. So this is a lot of forest in dark colors, little forest here in the lighter colors. Now let's take out that forest that has already been cleared because of agricultural expansion. About one third of the forest cover is gone. And if we now overlay those areas that are pristine, that are untouched by humans, just affected indirectly by via climate change, if we take out these areas, you'll see that most of the forest remains. So most of the forest is not in pristine areas, just a little bit here in the inner Amazon or up there, the very unproductive forests of the, of the um, high tundra regions. But most of the forest worldwide is managed by humans to some extent, either cleared or in this respect, managed for wood harvest, for wood products. How do we get there? Well, here we can um, look maybe at the evolution of land use change for the last 1000 years. This is the extent of cropland. We're now in the year 800, deep in medieval times. And you see, um, of course, agriculture has um, reached many parts of the, of the world, China, India, um, Europe in particular, also here the high cultures, which you don't see on the scale though. And now we, we go through, through history to show how um, agriculture has evolved. So population globally starts to increase. Um, and so agriculture consequently expands across the world, gets more intense. But you may want to look at your Europe now and you may see how agriculture goes back here because Black Death arrives, kills one third of the population and therefore a lot of agricultural land is abandoned and forests can regrow. Something similar now in China with the fall of the Ming Dynasty, upheavals. You now see how we're moving into the North American continent, moving um, west and also spreading here more into, into um, Eurasia. And now we're already in the future scenario where most of the deforestation or agricultural expansion will happen in the tropical regions. This led to that almost all of the world is um, touched by humans by land use today. Three quarters of the Earth's land surface are underused by humans. And this led people like Earl Ellis um, conclude that we could, should really speak about anthromes. A lot of scientists in the natural sciences and, and biology, um, we geographers, we used to speak of biomes. There's some natural biomes, tropical forest and so on. Doesn't exist is what, what um, Earl Ellis says. It's anthrones. It's a combined um, thing of humans and the natural ecosystems. And you can classify them into villages, croplands, rangelands, semi-natural, and then the wildlands, which again are really just in the very remote regions. And otherwise, humans have interfered everywhere. Another way how to depict this dominance of humans is if you look here um, at, the, at the mass of land mammals. And you see here's humans in the middle, whole of um, and a whole lot of the weight of, of global mammals is in the human um, bodies. And then you see our pets and livestock. You see cattle, horses, sheep, goats, pigs. What you don't see a whole lot is the green. That's the wild animals remaining. Down there, that's the massive elephants. But see how they're dwarfed by how humans dominate the system. And this led people to conclude that we have started um, a new epoch called the Anthropocene. And those from the land use community, like myself, we'd like to say that this is not something that happened after World War II in the 1950s with the Great Acceleration, but that this is really something that started 10,000 years ago when we invented agriculture. And this has massive consequences on climate. 
just look at this. This is a, a picture from, from Munich. Um, it used to be all woody vegetation and now um, a lot is managed urban areas or here you see a nice park. And you see the difference between something that would be more naturally expected like the forest and something that's clearly man-made like the meadow here. What does it mean we see that it's different? Well, this is exactly why there's an effect on climate because it also looks different to climate. For example, um, a forest would be much darker than um, the grassland and therefore it would absorb more solar energy. This is what we call the albedo or the reflectivity. But you also see it has a different structure. It's much rougher. And this means that turbulent heat fluxes, those of water or also um, sensible heat flux or so temperature related, that these also increase because with more turbulence in the air, you can carry more heat and water away from the land surface. And these together, these altered surface energy fluxes, hydrology is what we call the biogeophysical effects. But then there's the important effects on CO2, photosynthesis, carbon storage in the um, forest, much larger than in the meadow. And these altered carbon, but also nutrient balances, this is what we call the biogeochemical effects. And these are the sole focus of policy. So politicians think of CO2 and other greenhouse gases. They don't think of water and energy fluxes related to, to land use changes. And this I'd like to show you is a bit of a shame because there's a large potential there in making things right or screwing things up. But okay, let's stay with the political focus first um, and stay with the greenhouse gases. So what historically um, have we caused with our land use in terms of the greenhouse gas balance that's driving global warming? Um, in this study, we try to compile all the data that's there about greenhouse gas emissions from agriculture and forestry. So from all land use types. Overall, before we go into the plots here, um, we could conclude that about 25% of the total anthropogenic greenhouse gas emissions, land use plus fossil fuels, stem from land use. So about a quarter of all our anthropogenic emissions stem from land use. Now, while clearly we need to tackle these other three quarters of fossil fuel emissions and get those down to zero, a quarter of emissions is, is substantial too. And these emissions are much, much harder to mitigate because while we can go to renewable energies, we cannot stop um, eating. So we will always need agriculture. And this is substantial here, as you see, quarter of emissions. Emissions have not yet started to decrease, different from fossil fuel emissions, which thanks to economic changes and now also due to the COVID pandemic, started to decrease slowly, but at least they did. There's not, not no side of this in the land use sector. Let's look at this. So here you see a split of all the CO2, uh, methane and N2O emissions lumped together um, in, in a regional split. The net emissions of all together, the global emissions is the black line. And so of course you see land use can also take up CO2 when you do afforestation, for example, but overall clearly we have a lot of emissions into the atmosphere and these are increasing. And why are they increasing? Well, we see that this is stemming from Latin America and Sub-Saharan Africa, a bit from Southeast Asia, their emissions are increasing because we're clearing more and more pristine forests there. And these pristine forests are very dense in carbon and therefore they're causing so much emissions. It would be much more efficient if we grew the same type of crop in Europe, for example, where we already cleared the land a long time ago or the forests that recovered, they're not that carbon dense as they are in the tropical regions, but no, we're trading a whole lot. Um, and we get our much of our food from the tropical regions. And therefore um, we have this increase in, in um, greenhouse gas emissions from the land use sector recently. It's mostly CO2, but methane from wetlands and ruminants or N2O from, um, from fertilizers is also contributing to it. We can split the same types of emissions. You're always seeing the same black line here. We can also split them by type of process. And then you see that of course um, crops is the most important driver of these emissions, but also enteric fermentation. So um, beef, um, cattle, um, <laughs> grazing, um, they're, they're emitting a lot of methane, for example. In terms of products, um, of course, we're eating a whole lot of cereals, we're feeding a whole lot of cereals to animals. But when you look into, into the emissions, you realize that beef here also has a substantial part. In fact, it's contributing 25% to global land use emissions. But it's just, beef is just providing 1% of 
the calories that we're consuming globally. So there's a severe mismatch in the benefit that we're getting out of certain types of products and the emissions that we're causing by it. The world does not need 1% of calories. We can easily make up for that via more efficient um, growing of cereals, for example, or eating them directly instead of feeding them to the beef. But by this luxury, we're causing 25% extra emissions. How does it look like in, in terms of ecosystems? Um, here you see a map that we compiled based, based on remote sensing and inventory data. So inventories, you're going out, measure trees, how thick they are, how much carbon they contain, and you lump it all together with satellite imagery of the vegetation cover. And then um, we um, try to, to um, hindcast how the vegetation cover and the carbon content in it may have looked like in the absence of human interference um, a, a few thousand years ago. And based on these two types of maps, we can get at the reduction in um, biomass of the vegetation by human interference. And you clearly see um, areas that we saw prominent with agriculture before in Europe, in Asia, um, in the US, but also in the tropical regions. So their biomass has been reduced by up to 100% in some regions. Looking closer at how this biomass was taken away by humans is quite interesting. So here first you see it um, split into biomes, tropical rainforest, um, other tropical regions, subtropical vegetation, temperate and boreal one. The entire bar here shows you, for example, that in tropical rainforest, we um, would have had about 270 petagrams of carbon stored in the absence of human interference. But we're reducing that substantially because we're clearing forest. That's this part here. And then we are harvesting the forest, we're degrading it, we're using the forest, we leave it as a forest, but we're still using it a whole lot. And this adds an equal amount of carbon loss as the clear cut um, does. And the clear cut, that's what people are concerned about, what policymakers are concerned about. You see it from satellite, it's really scary, but it's just half of the story. You see that an equal amount of biomass has been removed by managing the forests in a way that obviously was not good for the carbon content. This is bad news on the one hand that we've lost so much carbon, but it's excellent news when you think about that we have a good handle on managing the forest in a sustainable way. So we can stop deforestation on the one hand, that's an obvious message, but we should also start thinking wisely about how we manage the land, because this is just equally important as the clear cutting of forest. So that was the greenhouse gas uh, perspective. That's the newest data on what is there and what the policymakers know about. And now I would like to show you a bit of what's not um, up high up in, in policymakers minds. And this is this issue of the biogeophysical effects here. And now this is really a bit complicated to include in aspects of how do we deal with global climate change? Why? Let's go back to the processes that we had. Um, we've said that, said that the forest is darker, absorbs more solar energy than a grassland. What would that mean in terms of temperature? It would mean that the forest is warmer than the grass. But we also said that the forest is rougher, creates more um, turbulent heat fluxes that transport heat away from the land surface. So what would that mean to temperatures? The forest would be cooler than grass. And which of these effects, and there's others too that play in, dominates the entire signal? That's very dependent on where you are, what type of forest you have, what type of agriculture you're replacing it with, how you manage that. And so it's not straightforward to, to get at, to, into that. And that's really the cutting, cutting edge science that we're currently um, dealing with to get a good handle on, on getting the net effect of this. We try to um, get a handle on, on these combined effects all together on the biogeophysical side for forest cover changes. We did that on the global scale. Again, this means you need to use complex models to really have the entire globe covered. And we did a thought experiment with such um, models that we calibrate against observations, so they're doing fairly fine. Um, and in this thought experiment, we um, assumed there was forest wherever forest could grow. And what would now happen if we took away all that forest and cleared it? So therefore, you can see a signal everywhere in the world. We have not cleared the forest everywhere in the world, luckily, yet. But this would show you what would happen if you cleared here, here, or there. So this map shows you the surface temperature change um, that would occur locally if you cleared the land here. How would temperature change in this piece of land? 
Um, and there are some, some cooling effects from deforestation in the boreal region that I'm happy to speak about and that comes about because the forest there is so dark. But globally, it's not, it's not the dominating effect. What's globally dominating is that deforestation makes the land surface where it has occurred warmer. You can see it's, it's sometimes one, two, three degrees that it makes it warmer when we clear the forest. And so here, for example, in Germany would be one, um, one degree that we um, would increase temperatures um, up to one degree um, locally. And so this is an important message first, that land use change can alter local temperatures by several degrees. And it affects temperatures in particular when we look into the temperature extremes. So down here, you see the minimum temperatures. They're getting cooler by deforestation. So these are nighttime temperatures, winter temperatures. So we may expect a bit more frost if we, if we clear the forest. But much more relevant is, because it's a much more massive change, here the increase in maximum temperatures that you would face if you cleared the land. And you see in the tropical regions, for example, you've got two degrees in extreme temperatures, more on top of the regular um, extreme temperatures by clearing the forest. So there are huge effects on local living conditions. But it also means that land use has a huge potential for us to adapt to global warming. Because what I've shown you here, well, this is deforestation. So we know for a lot of reasons, in particular what Chris Murray will be speaking about, like biodiversity, that it's not a good idea to clear the forest. But if we turned the signs of all these maps around, if we put minus to plus and the other way around, then we could use these maps to speak about afforestation. And then this message suddenly is, well, by adding forest to a landscape that we've cleared historically about forest, we could maybe make it cooler by a degree of two in the annual mean. Or we may be able to mitigate extreme temperatures that will become even more severe under global climate change. We may be able to mitigate those by two or three degrees if we reforest deforested um, landscapes. And those deforested landscapes exist everywhere here in the tropical and temperate regions. So now that we know it, there's a way how we should account for that also in terms of mitigation strategies and adaptation strategies to global warming. And um, we slowly um, start convincing policymakers that this is also something that needs to be on the agenda beyond the greenhouse gas perspective. And so with that, I'm coming to my um, basically last slide, one more, which um, tries to put a bit more perspective on this, these new challenges that lie ahead. So we need to decrease emissions, stop deforestation and so on reduce our um, the emissions, not fossil fuels only, but also the land use emissions and possibly changing our diets, which may be a good um, aspect anyway, because a very beefy diet is not exactly the most healthy one, but you in the audience know this much, much better than, than I do. But we also need to increase the CO2 uptake by vegetation. And there I've been speaking about carbon dioxide removal before. And here's just a few photos that should illustrate what that could mean. Well, first we should really, um, well, this is what, what's now in the agenda of, of, um, of all the climate pathways at, at national level. Um, they say we should afforest and reforest the land and then use that product, put that in long-term storage somewhere. We should also use biomass plantations like these. So you see massively high, my colleagues here are dwarfed by those and replace fossil fuels by these. We should um, think of how we can get more soil carbon accumulated by leaving the residues on the field, not something that we're currently doing in intensive agriculture. We should maybe apply biochar through pyrolysis, use biomass, make that in long lived material and spread that out on the fields. We may try to enhance weathering. Weathering of rock material is a CO2 sink. If you grind up mountains of material it will suck up CO2 and then we just have to spread the material somewhere. So maybe on the agricultural fields. But also other, other me methods like direct air capture and storage, ocean alkalinization. There's a whole lot of different methods how we can get um, CO2 removed from the, from the air. But the most prominent ones are those that I'm listing here because they're on land. Land is easily accessible. Land use is something we've done for 10,000 years. So we think we have a handle on how we can manage land. And therefore, there will be immense pressure on land in the future for very different purposes than in the past, but an immense pressure and therefore immense consequences for, for planetary health. 
and I'm very happy to discuss this this further in the following. So thank you very much. Yes, thank you very much for your presentation. It is mind blowing. It is very clear that what you are pointing to is a completely underestimated realm in our discussion so far, but also very much with policymakers. So I'm very happy that you're bringing this and I'm very, looking, very much looking forward to the discussion and the further cooperation with this, because this is not gonna go away. We are not gonna go away, so we will continue to cooperate on this. So now I hand over to Sophie to introduce Chris for the next presentation. And then we will discuss all of this and the connections at the end. Yeah, thank you very much again for this really interesting start. Uh, before I introduce our next speaker, just quickly that uh, the heads up that we will take questions after our next talk. So you can already put your questions in the chat right now, and then we will ask them later on. So now uh, let's go on to our second lecturer. Uh, Chris Murray is a disease ecologist who has worked at the interface of human, wildlife and environmental health for many years. Currently, he's an associate professor of environment and health at the MRC unit, The Gambia, at the London School of Hygiene and Tropical Medicine. He also served as the infectious disease lead for the Lancet Countdown on Climate Change and Health. Thank you for being here, Chris. Uh, before you start your talk, uh, let me ask one question. What got you first interest in the field, interested in the field and how did you end up where you are now? That is a terrifically difficult question. I have no no clear answer of how the hell I ended up here now. It's, it's really quite a complex path that I've taken. I started off as my first slide in my talk is going to illustrate. I started off um, as a biologist. I was working in the field with, with wildlife, with lizards actually back in the day, looking at the mating systems of um, these beautiful big skinks that live in Australia. I was very, very focused on Animal, animal behavior and, and very, very fundamental ecological questions. And increasingly um, over the sort of a period of about sort of five or six years, I started to get sort of increasingly aware and increasingly alarmed about the sort of state of the planet. And that, that's where I, my research started to take, take a more applied kind of direction. So I started to look for this, these types of questions that were, that were more about the preservation of the natural world and the conservation of the natural world. And I'll talk a little bit about how I got to here now, uh, following that very strange pathway. Thank you very much yeah. for this short insight. Um, and yeah, if you want to go ahead and take over. Okay, good. So um, I've got a bit of a mixed bag of a talk today. Um, I'm gonna talk about global change, of course. I'm gonna talk about biodiversity, which um, Julia and Martin have kind of mentioned and, 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 and the role of ecosystems. Um, and then I'm gonna touch on sort of like a, a, a focal topic. In this case, I'm gonna talk a little bit about infectious disease emergence as a result of some of the global changes that we'll be talking about here. Um, hopefully the reason why will become clear as I go through. Um, as I mentioned, I'm an ecologist, so in this, field of purity diagram. Um, you can see me there holding the, the octopus. I, I couldn't find a picture of me holding an octopus. In fact, I don't think I've ever held an octopus, but I've got a picture of me holding a koala there. Um, and that koala actually has a sexually transmitted disease called chlamydia. So it's not quite as cute as, as maybe um, it looks in the, in the picture there. But that illustrates my background. I've worked on infectious diseases primarily and parasites and pathogens um, in, my, in my career. And that's, that's how I went from being a wildlife biologist to now working at this interface of human health and environmental change. So let me start at, at you know, back at what is sometimes sort of considered to be a sort of a turning point in the conservation biology world. There was a guy, still is a guy called Jared Diamond. He's written a bunch of really interesting um, popular science books. Some of you would have read things like guns, germs, and steel, you know, that kind of like history of the planet sort of thing. Um, but he's actually a, a legitimate biologist. And back in the day, he was working in, in Papua New Guinea uh, on birds and, and, and thinking a lot about extinction. And he coined this, um, this sort of analogy or leveraged this existing, um, you know, kind of, kind of story, this biblical story about the four horsemen of the apocalypse. He kind of twisted it to, to become the four horsemen of the ecological apocalypse. He was talking about what are the processes that are driving 
extinction of, of, of biodiversity. And the things that he identified initially were things like overhunting and overexploitation, uh, introduced species, um, and then the habitat destruction as being a sort of a key driver of, 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 uh, of, of loss of, of animal abundance, leading to increased extinction risk. And then this idea that you've got, once you've got some, some of these, these parts moving, you get this kind of um, you know, positive feedback loop where things start kind of connecting together and you get these chains of extinctions or these cascades through um, ecosystems where one species is affecting another and, and before you know it, you're, you've lost a lot of, a lot of species through, this, through these chains. And then sort of since that time, climate change has become a lot more um, of a sort of a significant and widely recognized um, issue, not just in biology, but across all, you know, all, all the dimensions of, of life now. And it's great to see that, in, you know, although it's taken medics and public health people a much longer time to start thinking seriously about climate change, um, you know, it's also become a really major feature of this new, new sort of field that we're calling planetary health or whatever. Um, and and since, since, since we've sort of like setting up this, this, this four horsemen kind of apocalypse, I'm going to, I'm going to try to talk to each, you know, to, to a little bit about some of these things as it relates to biodiversity and ultimately to, to disease emergence. Getting to the health part of this, so ecological public health is a field of health that's been around for a long time. Um, this is sort of predates things like One Health and Eco Health and Planetary Health. Um, is the recognition that you know you have to have some kind of sustainable uh, you know sustainable use of the planet in order to ensure um, you know or to safeguard human health ultimately. Um, and this idea has been around for a long time, and it was sort of crystallised towards the end of the last um, you know the last century, coinciding with some of these big reports, the Lalonde report, the um, you know the, some of the stuff I was talking about with Jared Diamond, really bringing a new sense of urgency to the loss of biodiversity as an issue and how that, that affects ecosystem services and things. That sort of stuff got baked into the Earth Summit in 1992, and that turned into the Millennium, um, the Millennium Ecosystem Assessment, which had a health chapter thinking about how ecosystem services sustained human populations. And then that brings us to where we are now. This is this sort of like classic triad or this, this sort of interconnection idea between healthy environments, healthy animals and healthy people. And so, and so most of you should be fairly familiar with this, um, you know, this kind of mashing of different fields and, 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 and this is the area of activity that we're in now. So let's talk about some of that stuff a bit more specifically. Let's talk about biodiversity loss. This is a figure that comes from a paper in Nature a few years ago um, by some, by some colleagues of mine actually, some people I went to university with, they took a, a, an assessment of um, all of the different uh, drivers of extinction and threatened, uh, the, the way that species become um, classified as threatened with extinction and the various different levels. And they ranked these different drivers of you know, contributing to this biodiversity crisis. So things like over-exploitation, agricultural activity, urban development, disease and invasive species, pollution, and then right down the end there, we've got climate change as well. Um, and we're really talking about here a just a catastrophic loss of biodiversity. We're in a new era in terms of, in terms of the state of the planet uh, and its biodiversity, some people calling this the sixth mass extinction, putting it on sort of a par. And in fact, plenty of people sort of um, pointing out that some of the stuff that we're seeing now with biodiversity loss is more rapid than, for example, what we saw with the um, you know, the loss of the dinosaurs. So we're talking very, very serious uh, biodiversity crisis. When you listen to that, uh, some of the stuff that Julia was talking about um, with respect to land use, you can sort of see why that's the case. This is another sort of similar kind of concept here. This is the human footprint index. So this includes um, land use, you know, use of, of land for crops and urban, you know, built environments, but it also includes a few other things where we recognize the pressure that humans are putting on landscapes. Um, and this was an assessment done in 2010, I think is the year of the most recent assessment. There was another assessment of this human footprint index um, around about 2000. So we were able to calculate the change in the pressure, the net sort of the cumulative pressure that humans are putting on the planet um, at a reasonable sort of spatial resolution. And you can kind of see here that there are 
areas of the world that are actually improving with respect to the pressure that, 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 that we're putting on, on landscapes. But for the most part, the pressure is increasing. And I think Julia's um, talk really sort of, you know, kind of illustrated the, the, the extent of this, this human land use um, kind of process in, in driving and shaping ecosystems and what's in them. The plot above sort of represents that. This classifies the number of different ecoregions that are either getting better or worse. This bar in the middle here with the purple dotted line is the sort of the no change bar. So quite a few areas are not showing much change. Very few areas are showing an, improve, an, an improvement and most of those ecoregions are showing um, declines or increasing pressure. Land use is a big part of it. This is the biodiversity translation of that with respect to the richness of species that are occurring in different ecosystems relative to some baseline where we imagine there was sort of, you know, an untouched um, habitat. Julia used the same um, kind of methodology with when she was referring to the change in, in vegetation. This is the same type of graph, but for the richness of all of the, um, you know, birds and mammals and um, everything that's in this ginormous database called Predix. And what this shows is that for sure that land use is the major driver of, of biodiversity loss. Um, and we can see very clearly where those effects are, are concentrated um, in, in, in space. And, and this map looks, uh, you know, if you blur your eyes, this, look, this looks very similar to what, to, to those maps that Julia was, was showing. If we get into that in a little bit more detail, you can kind of sort of classify landscapes relative to this baseline of sort of untouched or primary forest or primary habitat, what was there before humans started to mess around with it. And you see there, that's, that's what we're seeing in this kind of light green color in both of these plots. One is showing the species richness, that is the, the number of different species in a particular place. And the other one on the bottom, the plot at the bottom is showing the abundance. So the total, um, the, the percentage change of abundance so primary is the baseline here. And as you, as you move through these land use categories um, towards the right along on the X axis, you're moving into increasingly impacted types of land cover. So you're going to um, you know, manage forests, you're moving into plantations and cropland pasture, and then ultimately urban. And you can kind of see that both species richness and abundance is, 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 is on average decreasing as you're increasing that human pressure. Um, from you know the transformation from natural habitat right through to where there's basically no natural habitat left. Talking about climate change now a little bit. Um, so as you would have seen from that previous um, plot that I showed about the threats to biodiversity, climate change actually didn't feature that prominently in that list. It was only ranked number five or six, and that reflects the fact that climate change hasn't yet really had its major impact on biodiversity. A lot of the anticipated impact of climate on biodiversity is, is sort of in the pipeline. Um, it's considered a major threat for future biodiversity loss. And at the moment it's putting pressure on a lot of species, but there's actually you know, surprisingly few concrete examples of climate change driving species to extinction. There are a couple, but not that many at the moment. Um, but there are a lot of warning signs and we've got some models that sort of show why people are particularly concerned about climate with, you know, when we're talking about biodiversity loss. This is another sort of review um, of the impact of climate on all sorts of different biological processes. Uh, and what this study showed, it was like a big sort of systematic review. What this study showed is that around about 80% of all the processes that have been monitored uh, in some climate, climate context have been shown to be, to be um, impacted by changes in, in, in climatic variables. There's been, as Julia mentioned, an, an overall increase in the average global temp temperature of over one degree now. Um, and we're seeing impacts of that from, you know, genes right through to entire ecosystems. So that's, that's you know, it's a kind of a complicated plot here, but the, the take home is nothing is safe really from climate change. Uh, wherever you look, you find the signatures of climate change in, in shaping biological processes. And those biological processes sum up to ultimately create and, and maintain ecosystems. So that's not really a big surprise. This is a, um, a study uh, that, that tried to estimate what the impact of climate change is going to be on biodiversity. So this is the, this is a direct effect. This is independent of the land use effect that we've been talking about before. Um, and basically what this kind of complicated bubble chart shows is that as you increase the overall um, 
temp global temperature that's re reflected by these different scenarios, what we call representative concentration pathway scenarios, where 8.5 is the most um, significant amount of warming due to the fact that there's more and more, more emissions in that scenario. Um, you can see that by the time you get up to an RCP 8.5 scenario, around about 15 or 16 percent of global biodiversity is considered at risk of extinction. Now, we're still quite a long way away from that RCP 8.5. We're actually closer at the moment, somewhere between the 2.8 and the 5.2, which are the one shown, the two shown on this plot, um, which is sort of anticipating around about a global um, temperature rise. I think at the moment, people are thinking it'll be around about sort of, you know, between two and four, maybe three degrees, something like that. So we're not meeting the Paris Agreement at the moment, as, as Julia mentioned. So that's going to put us in the range of, you know, anywhere between sort of five and 15% biodiversity loss from, from climate change alone. So in summary, um, we've modified uh, more than 50% of the Earth's ice-free land surface. I think Julia's statistic on that was slightly higher. We've raised sea levels by something like three millimetres a year, and that's, that's actually accelerating. We've acidified the oceans by something like 30%. We've increased the rate of extinction by three or four orders of magnitude relative to the background rate. Um, we've changed the climate by more than a degree. Uh, there's been a three-fold increase in the global population just since 1950 and a 56-fold increase in international travel since 1950. So the world now is almost unrecognisable compared to what our, um, you know, you know, if people in the audience have, have, you know, elderly grandparents at the time that they were born, the world was a fundamentally different place. And that is what is, is starting to sort of prompt this conversation around the Anthropocene, when it started and how it's manifesting and, and the state of the planet and what, what's gonna happen over the course of the next several, several decades. So let's quickly come back to health, which I think is going to be the sort of primary interest. Um, how does all this stuff translate? Health, contrary to these um, really alarming trends in biodiversity loss and land use and all the rest of it, Health has really never looked better than it looks right now. If you look at the global average of all of the different metrics that we have um, to measure the, the, the various characteristics of, 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 of populations, this is this inset plot here is a, just a sort of a, a chart of the life expectancy in all of the countries of the world. And you can kind of see that, you know, all of the countries in the world, except those that have maybe some, you know, really major um, you know, conflicts leading to breakdown in governments and things like that. Almost all countries in the world are living longer. People are generally generally healthier now than they ever have been. Um, and that, you know, that one of the kind of hallmarks of that is the increase in the burden of non-communicable diseases, um, which is sort of displacing the burden of infectious diseases, which is here shown in, in red. So this is one of the hallmarks of global health is that we've managed to kind of get infectious diseases um, in some way, you know, under control or starting to get those, uh, those diseases under control. There are exceptions to that. And, um, the, you know, there's, so here's some examples here. We have plague, rabies, Lyme disease, and hantavirus. There's just a couple of examples that are showing, you know, sort of bucking this trend. They're increasing in incidence or increasing in their impact. And these are diseases that we call emerging diseases. Uh, emerging diseases are those diseases that are sort of doing funny things increasing where they should be decreasing or appearing in new places or appearing for the first time, those, those kinds of things. This is a particular group of diseases that's particularly interesting because of the potential for new diseases or, or diseases doing weird things that have, just have catastrophic impacts on, on society. So um, Julia mentioned plague and the effect that that had on killing a third of the European population. That changed land use, that changed climate emissions, that changed, you know, you know, a certain, you know, part of the carbon balance of the, of the earth at that time. So these, these are just massive, massive events. So they, they don't contribute much to the global burden of disease in normal times, but they have the potential to really do very scary things. Um, and, you know, obviously in COVID times, some of this stuff is, you know, we're, we're living this, we're living in an age, you know, in, in what people are calling the age of, of emergence or pandemic age. So we can see firsthand how impactful some of these things can be. The thing about emerging infections is that some people think that they're increasing through time. Um, the evidence on that is still a little bit mixed, I think, but if we take that as a, as a, as a sort of, you know, take this plot as an example of, of an increasing trend, we can kind of see that through time, the number of new things that we're seeing is increasing. 
Um, and probably more relevant is that a big proportion of those, those, those diseases doing weird things come from animals. And a big proportion of those, or about three quarters of those ones that are coming from animals are coming specifically from, from wildlife species. So these are, these are things that we're calling zoonotic diseases and where wildlife is involved, we're calling those um, wildlife origin zoonoses. Around about 45% of all um, new or uh, of, of emerging infectious diseases come from ultimately from, from wildlife. So this is where we start to you know, join the dots a little bit. This is a schematic of a, of a landscape where we have um, you know, a biosphere here where everybody's living. We've got all of our ecosystems, all of our built infrastructure, our, our agricultural landscapes, all of our wildlife, uh, sorry, all of our wildlife, uh, uh, sorry, all of our livestock uh, and our livestock that's interacting with wildlife and that wildlife is also interacting with us. And this, this kind of overlap of these different spheres is in some cases what we think is leading to the, the emergence of, of these new diseases. So things like even HIV is considered to be um, you know, a reflection of some change in an ecosystem that's put um, you know, humans in contact with, contact with animals and allowed through global sort of transport networks to, to release that pathogen into the human population. But other examples that people will be very familiar with, Ebola, rabies, SARS, um, yellow fever, Lyme, hantavirus, just to sort of name a few of those. Um, I mentioned COVID as a recent example of that. Um, sort of, you know, it's, it's, what, what to say about COVID? It's, it's, a, it's a zoonosis. I think everybody knows that. Um, it probably originated from horseshoe bat. And so a lot of that stuff I was talking about, about the interfaces and the impacts on biodiversity and stuff, people jump, jump you know, to the sort of conclusion that COVID is just another example of this process sort of playing out. Um, at the moment, it's still a bit sort of early to really be very conclusive about what's happened with COVID. We really don't know what that process was of moving from a, from a bat into the human population. It's under investigation, of course. So let's just talk a little bit about the components of this system that we need um, in order to have this. Um, sorry, I'm looking around for a clock here. I uh, can't see. You can somebody give me a time check? How much time have I got left? We have four past six, so you have another five to seven minutes, something like this. Okay, no problems. Um, so this is a, um, the, uh, a, a conceptual sort of diagram of um, what. What, what, what is required for spillover to occur from um, humans or life, uh, from wildlife or livestock into the human population. So we have sort of three main um, areas of different processes. We've got the prevalence of pathogens in the reservoir, we've got the human animal contact rate, and we have the, the likelihood that an infection will take in the human population. So that can be modified, for example, by vulnerability factors. And the interesting thing here with respect to the global change story is that environmental impacts are directly uh, and in many cases indirectly affecting each of these processes. It's a very complicated landscape to try to work out what the net effect of that will be. And let me try and give you um, some examples of that. This is a very simple um, schematic of the layers that are involved in um, the appearance of a disease, which you see at the top of this diagram. At the very bottom, you have the geography, then you have the environment, then you've got a whole bunch of reservoirs and vectors and humans in this kind of like washing machine doing, you know, lots of interactions in this biosphere that I was mentioning before. And together that creates the, the appearance of these disease. And, and of course, multiple diseases can occur in the same place. Um, so we might think of an, of an unimpacted landscape as a sort of a natural landscape. Um, and we can ask the question, is that a healthy landscape or an unhealthy landscape? So some people might suggest that the change in landscape can lead to the um, change in the processes involved in the appearance of these diseases. It could increase certain vector species. It could increase certain reservoir species. It could um, increase the rate of a pathogen being able to, to um, proliferate. And in some cases, this could lead to additional diseases in a landscape. This is what we might call unhealthy landscape as a result of land use change or climate change is another, another process. And those examples that I mentioned before are, are, are disease specific examples of where we think this, is, this has actually happened. Um, 
Oops, going the wrong way there. The contrast to that is actually maybe we can manage landscapes or we can affect landscapes to eliminate diseases. And probably for the most part, that's happened in, you know, for example, well-managed urban systems where you've got health access and interventions that come in and um, can help counteract some of the disease risks. Maybe some of those disease risks are fundamentally altered because you lose certain disease reservoirs or you lose certain vectors. Um, the, 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 I think the difficulty at this moment is what is the net response of land use or climate change or any other environmental change? Are we creating fundamentally healthier or fundamentally less healthy landscapes through the impacts that we're, that we're having? Uh, I can't really give you an answer to that, but I can tell you um, just how complicated it is to try to work this out. So here's some stats about things that try to kill us. There are around about 2,000 pathogens known in humans. Um, the breakdown is, you know, several hundred viruses, a thousand bacteria, et cetera, et cetera. If we look at those that are zoonotic or vector-borne, we see that the majority are zoonotic, as I mentioned before. Quite a few are vector-borne, but where you are vector-borne, you're also very likely to be zoonotic. And where you are zoonotic, you're also very likely to be, to be vector-borne. In addition to that, very few diseases only have one vector or one reservoir. Most diseases that affect humans have multiple vectors and multiple reservoirs. In addition to that, there's this whole pool of, 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 of diversity of pathogens that exist in the world, in, in uh, wildlife. Some estimates put that at, you know, in, the, in the millions, others are a little bit more realistic and put it in the sort of you know, the, the, the 10,000 kind of range. But the, the point is there are a lot of pathogens or potential pathogens that occur in wildlife that could get into people. Um, and we are sort of experimenting at the moment with, with, you know, with what that might look like. Um, it's very difficult to imagine going through disease by disease and working out what the impact of these environmental changes will be. So an alternative to that is to think about the macroecological kind of drivers of the disease landscape. So this is a map, a global map of the total number of zoonotic diseases that occur at a country level. You can see there's some variation at the global level with that. And we can use models to try to tease apart, well, what explains that variation? Is it something to do with the climate? Is it something to do with the health infrastructure? Is it something to do with how people are sort of traveling around the world? You know, has it got something to do with surveillance or whatever? If we run those models through, we get to something that looks like this. This is a preliminary model. We haven't published this yet. In the middle, we have disease richness, which is the total number of zoonotic pathogens that occur in a country. In green, we have factors that are influencing it in a positive way. So climate, this is actually sort of some kind of tropicalization uh, measure of climate where um, increasingly tropical types of climates has a positive direct impact on disease richness. But climate is also shaping the diversity of, of wildlife as well. Wildlife diversity turns out to be the main predictor of disease richness. And that makes sense given what I've said before about just how many of those pathogens are shared with people. In red, we have a negative association. So this is health. This is actually the health expenditure per capita of a country goes some way in reducing the overall zoonotic disease richness in a country. So we know that we can do some stuff to put a lid on these risks. The thing I think the take home here is, and the thing that kind of it, it continually kind of shocks me, is that if we break these processes up into the things that we're affecting, but have some control versus no control, on this side in green, we have some control over health expenditure. We can choose how much to invest in health. We can choose how we manage the connectivity of the population. We can choose certain things about, you know, um, you know how, the, how the, 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 the nature of the human population. In blue, we have things that we are definitely impacting very significantly, things like climate and things like biodiversity, as I've mentioned, but we are having zero control really about the trajectory of that. So we really are not doing this in a controlled way. And I think that's what's really scary. When you see that these things are ultimately the main drivers of the, the landscape of diseasiness that we're encountering. Um, I'm going to skip this slide just in the interest of time, other than to say that although this 
models suggest that increasing biodiversity increases disease richness, there are also examples of where biodiversity loss itself is also increasing disease richness. And I'm happy to take questions about that apparent paradox um, after the, uh, after, you know, during the Q&A, for example. So coming back to this kind of planetary health concept, this is a, a model um, called the planetary boundaries, which I'm sure most of you would have come across at some point. It sort of splits up the Earth uh, system into a sort of subsystems. These are interconnected subsystems. Uh, and in the colors is sort of a measure of how far towards some theoretical threshold we, are, we have traveled. Um, and there's this kind of idea that once you pass a certain you know, point of no return, you start to really, really disrupt the functioning, functioning of these systems and then start to sort of threaten what these authors call the, the, um, the you know, operational space for humanity. And so some of the things that are really quite concerning in this planetary boundaries um, kind of model is the way that we're influencing biochemical flows in the environment. So some people think that we are past the point of no return. So we've fundamentally altered the biogeochemistry of the, of the, of the Earth. You'll also see in um, the, the climate change wedge that we are halfway along this journey, according to this diagram, towards this threshold. We've influenced the climate. We're not sure if we're past the point of no return and we don't really know what the consequences are going to be is the take home of this assessment. The area that I want to sort of mention is that we is this sort of biosphere integrity bit where we have this really big red wedge, red and yellow wedge for genetic diversity. This is representing the current picture of biodiversity loss at a global level. We have lost so much biodiversity that people have started to think we have permanently and irreversibly damaged the ecosystem services that, 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 that ecosystems provide to us for free because of that loss of biodiversity. So this is really crisis talk kind of thing. And when it comes to emerging infectious diseases, it's really this blue square that is really driving the majority of these processes. It's that interaction between land system change, biosphere integrity and climate change, which is exactly what Julia was talking about before as well. My closing slide, I didn't mention that I'm now based in the Gambia in West Africa. Um, I lead a planetary health program here. And the idea is to start trying to apply some of this knowledge and think about some of the solutions to some of these problems um, in an applied context. And you know, where I was very comfortable living in London and before that in America, um, really thinking about some of this stuff from a, from, a, from a desktop, from a computational modeling kind of perspective, now I'm, I'm in a position where I'm interested in, in, in seeing this stuff translate in the real world, the sort of mitigation adaptation agenda that Julia uh, you know, very nicely introduced to us. The Gambia is just an example study system, but here is a, a map of how the human footprint that I mentioned before has changed in the Gambia. You can see that by far the majority of the country has, has experienced an increase in human pressure. Um, only a few areas have experienced some kind of a decrease. And what I'm interested in doing here is setting up projects and, and, and recruiting projects here, getting collaborations going that can start to investigate some of these processes that both Julia and, uh, Julia and I, I've been talking about with respect to the human health endpoint of these changes. So this is really the planetary health, um, you know, this is, the, this is the agenda of the planetary health group that we've formed here. I stole this in real time from Julia's talk. Sorry if I was a bit distracted at the beginning. Um, I was copying and pasting her proposed, um, you know, solutions for carbon um, capture or carb, you know, reducing carbon emissions in landscapes and thinking about, well, which one of these might apply in this context? We have real landscapes, we have real people out earning livelihoods, people trying to get enough food to eat, people trying to have enough um, income to support their families, their kids to go to school, all the rest of it. And I'm kind of trying to think in real time, which one of these is, is really going to, to you know, give us some kind of, you know, something to play with here. The thing that I noticed here, and, and without, without wanting to be at all critical, is that this really illustrates the, 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 the scale of the challenge that we've got to do this. If I look at this picture here, there's really nothing except for the afforestation, reforestation, and sorry, Julia, but you chose a monoculture here to really show, to, to illustrate this. this. All of this stuff would be devastating for biodiversity. Uh, well, maybe not devastating, but it doesn't do much to improve the state of biodiversity. And so for me, this is not really doing much to change the state of play with respect to the emerging infectious disease story. 
and that that whole kind of agenda of, of, of you know trying to also rescue biodiversity while we're trying to trying to sort of mitigate climate change. This really illustrates the dimension of the challenge. This was really nicely captured in that study by um, by Tim Newbold that I showed earlier. This is a, a scenario that looks at the shape of biodiversity, the, the, the trend of biodiversity, according to these mitigation um, options that we have, according to four or five different models. And it's really interesting to note here that the, that the second most mitigating scenario here gives the, you know, gives, you know, one of the worst outcomes for, for biodiversity. So there's, there can be this direct conflict between what we're trying to achieve in one sector, i.e. mitigation, and what we're trying to achieve in another, i.e. health or biodiversity. And, and I know that Julie is 100% aware of all that sort of stuff. I thought I'd just capitalise on that opportunity to illustrate that um, in real time. And that's it. Uh, thanks very much for, for having me. Chris, thank you very much for your mind-blowing talk. And uh, it's just a beautiful example, the two lectures of how much we need uh, to be developing our ability to work across disciplines. Um, it just reminds me when we started our journey of making kind of climate change and health a bigger subject after about half a year and through the intervention of Sabine Gabrisch, uh, we much more moved from our own understanding into planetary health and kind of the two talks have clearly outlined why we need to be willing to dive into the complexities and stay with the challenges, stay with the trouble to find solutions that not only kind of help us uh, make progress in one dimension, but across the dimensions. So to really have the planetary health perspective. So thank you very much for both laying this out and also Chris for being an example of just uh, taking in the input from Julia, working with it and now kind of being in a conversation with her, but also with all of us in how to move forward. So um, perhaps I want to give the word first to Julia. Um, I mean, he, he was kind of talking to you through his presentation. Perhaps you want to have a comment on this, um, which I think is a, it's, a, it's a beautiful also example of how this place brings people together and how we all kind of need to, to, to kind of start these kind of tough and honest and, and direct conversations. Julia, perhaps you want to comment on what you are yeah, yeah. First, Chris. thank Chris a lot for that talk, and and I really learned a lot by because you made the, all these connections so very clear. And I think it's exactly the point also that you, Martin, mentioned. Now it's it's we're all in our fields, and we're only starting to get them together. But there's so much you can do right or wrong, disregarding the other interests. So even in the climate space, I was always saying you saw CO2 and there's greenhouse gases on one side, but then there's the biogeophysical effects that could warm or cool. You need to consider both. Again, it's just a small piece of the entire picture and all what you were showing with the biodiversity, with the, with the health impact that it has with the reservoirs um, changing size, depending on all these different factors, but so the science can, can still be unclear and so on. This is exactly what we need. We need much more exchange across the disciplines and we need much more understanding also in, in terms of that, of the language, we need to share that. And in the end, I think we also need to get integrated models or integrated assessments of how we can make these things comparable and in the end also evaluate them against each other because in the very end it's going to be a clash of conflicts we can we can look for synergies but there will always be trade-offs too and then it would be good to know how we can evaluate these different variables against each other and also against the time dimensions that they have some are more important now but others will be more in the future and so it's also we're getting into, into ethics here and, and, and so on so so thanks thanks a lot for for that and your point was very good that that the land use this cdr this carbon dioxide removal that we are now putting all our hopes on could be a catastrophe in many other ways thank you very much uh, julia i also welcome sabine gabrish who has joined us for the discussion she can chip in whenever she wants um chris anything you are taking also from this dialogue or from just you, what julia was pointing out um, well, I, mean, I think no, Julia is like spot on with mentioning this kind of trade-off. There is no reason to think that, that the that, 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 that the win-win opportunities there outnumber any other combination of, of outcomes. You could have win-wins, you could have neutral neutrals, you could have lose-losers. The thing that we need to do is, is avoid the things that have the biggest cumulative costs and foster the things that have the biggest cumulative gains. Um, but working out what they are is just the just a mind-blowingly difficult task.
task and bringing that to a local level is also mind-blowingly difficult. What to do with that patch of land over there that has a certain land use um, kind of pivot point in it. We could reforest it, we could turn it into mixed crop, we could turn it into a monocrop. How do we make those decisions in real time, in real space, with real people? That I think that's really where some of the kind of um, the richest, the you know, the richest conversations that I've had, I think, come back to that, to the realism of implementing some of this stuff. And this is coming from somebody that spent most of their time thinking globally, working on global level models where I'm interested in sort of like the net, the net, uh, you know, the net picture, the net benefits, the net cost, that kind of thing that can be extremely different to what's happening on, on you know at, at a local local level and i think that's really where a lot of the science is 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 you know the challenges for science really lay uh, for the next certainly the, you know for my foreseeable future anyway <laughs> which is pointing out that we need to be willing on a local level and also on a global level to to work with experiments to get together jointly to see what are early signs of are we in the right direction or not so we cannot wait with our science 10 years later and then five years of kind of doing the numbering and then come back and say oh by the way it doesn't look like it you went in the right direction we just don't have the time so it means we have to re define what science can bring in a time when we have so much time pressure and at the same time it is of the essence to to to, to work on local levels transdisciplinary but also on a global mm. level and be in conversation with each other but not paralyzed to now wait because I, I haven't heard back from you for the last three years so it's kind of uh, yeah very interesting challenge um, Sophie do you want to bring in some questions from the audience. I, I first would, would add a little question and then I would hand over to the audience maybe um, or we can collect. Um, so one question I have is because Martin started uh, outlining very well about windows of opportunity that are opening up with regards to the space and um, you also outlined um, the connection to health and to pandemics and I now hear the connection between pandemics and biodiversity from many places. So just today, the report of the Independent Panel for Pandemic Preparedness and Response came out, again, underlining biodiversity. So I was just wondering whether you, uh, and also maybe both of you feel that there are windows of opportunity currently opening up in your spaces. Um, yeah, just handing to you. And then we will take some questions. I mean, I'm going to answer first, um, just because I spoke about that stuff, I guess. Um, so I, I think in, in what might sound as a bit of a contrast to what I spoke about, I've been relatively kind of, you know, I, I haven't been very comforted by a lot of the narrative from, you know, around biodiversity and pandemics that has been catalyzed specifically by COVID. The fact that we're in a pandemic has kind of blinded us to the quality of the evidence around a lot of this stuff. So it's not that we're going to go out and protect that patch of rainforest and that's going to reduce or prevent the next pandemic. Although that is the narrative that's making the news a lot of the time. I think that's completely unrealistic. The state of science at the moment is really, really patchy. Uh, a lot of that stuff that I was kind of integrating comes from, you know, lots and lots of different, different studies. But if you go to a specific place in the world and say, I'm going to do this to this landscape, and that's going to do this to disease risk or the risk of emerging infections, you know, it's, we're, we're very far away from that, from that. Sort of point at the moment it's important that we we concentrate some of the attention to the real basic like the real baseline health protection stuff it's fine to spend a billion dollars trying to stop the next pandemic at source provided that we spend money effectively to also allow some places to catch up with the very basics of health infrastructure first because the risk of what we're doing to prevent the next the next pandemic is not going to be a silver bullet so you know I, I get a little bit sort of conflicted when I sort of um, you know and, and I can feel my own conflict of interest when I put my ecologist hat on because I want to save species I want to save ecosystems I want so much for that to also stop the next pandemic but the science is really just it's just too patchy at the moment to tell us how to do that other than to say from a precautionary principle perspective there's a risk we know that there's a risk we don't know where it is and specifically what it is but from a precautionary principle, it makes sense to protect as much remaining habitat and as much remaining species as we can. But you don't even need the pandemic piece 
to say those things because we already know the importance of biodiversity across a huge number of dimensions, not just pandemic risk. So yeah, it may, it may sound like a bit of a, a you know, kind of a, um, you know, a conflict with what I talked about, but that's, that's my, my, my own personal um, perspective right now, you know, as it stands. I think in, in my field, the, the window of opportunity, that's climate, climate itself, right? It's the pandemic itself, the Green Deal recovery. We are going to hope it's going to be a green recovery. Currently, things are not looking good. Emissions are higher again than last year, although we thought we have finally crossed this, this um, peak emissions. We have to see. And then um, th there's a lot of more knowledge now that could lead to creating these synergies across disciplines, across spheres. That is clearly something we simply didn't have that knowledge. We didn't have these connections, these networks that would bring these different perspectives together. So that's good. We're also educating a new generation of, of people. And then there's a lot of international pressure that also didn't exist in terms of land use, tropical deforestation, in terms of pinning down the drivers of, of for example, tropical deforestation, that a lot of that is international trade and so on. So this is helping change things, but still not as quickly as they should. Great, thank you very much. I think now we can hold over to uh, questions from the audience, Hannah. Yes, thanks. So thanks for the talk from the side of the audience as well. Um, it was uh, they were very lively uh, in the Q&A. So first, um, a question to, to Julia. Um, how do you estimate the benefits of um, native re reforestation? So re-rainforestation, for example, versus larger scale um, biomass reforestation projects? Yeah, so this you, you have to, to evaluate all these different carbon dioxide removal technologies against each other. And um, for example, re reforestation has a lot of benefits in terms of you could restore it more to a natural ecosystem state that's possibly more biodiverse than if you had a massive biomass plantation. There's no not much other species in there. But a forest is slow to regrow, it's vulnerable. So the CO2 that's accumulating there over years, one drought after the other would just kill the forest and the CO2 is gone. The biomass plantation, you can harvest and harvest and that's safer, so to say. So these are all the different things. The, the, um, the water cycle will be altered in a very different way in a forest. That's forest is usually good to, to mitigate and, and buffer water scarcity much better than such a biomass plantations. So this has been really traded against each other and also depends very much on which field you're at, which would be more advantageous to do. Okay, thank you. Um, then a next question to Chris, um, also connected to biodiversity, obviously. Um, so are there forms of agriculture that don't affect um, biodiversity or that could even reinforce biodiversity? And if yes, is there um, scientific research on this? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, if you go back to that land use um, figure that I showed in your mind, you see that the more you trend, you, the more you depart from the native or the, the baseline state, the more biodiversity that you lose. So it follows then that the more natural vegetation that you have in any area, the more biodiversity you're likely to retain. And that's one of the themes in sort of farm friendly or biodiversity friendly farming is that you try to retain features of the natural environment that allow a certain you know, subset of the original biodiversity to persist there. Species responses to land use change are incredibly complicated and you know, they're complex in the sense that they, um, they vary on the traits of the species themselves. So we know that some species are relatively um, you know, resistant to land use change. Others are extremely sensitive. Some are very, very habitat specific. Others are more um, habitat generalist. So manipulating landscapes in a way that we can retain, you know, a reasonable mix of the functional diversity of the original biodiversity that was there is really the sort of goal, I think, of, you know, biodiversity friendly farming. Um, I think where that is a challenge is that you, you know, the, the state of play at the moment is we don't quite know whether we can do that and maximize the, you know, food production potential of that exact same space and maybe Sabine actually has some you know better insights on this but it's been kind of demonstrated that we're, we're producing more and more food per per um, you know hectare of land uh, you know than ever before getting more and more efficient at doing it the question is can we preserve that efficiency by returning to a state that is a little bit not that, that's not you know intensive monoculture that also retains mixed cropping and what benefits can that have not just for biodiversity but also 
food security, you know, vulnerability to climate extremes and that kind of thing. So, you know, not putting all your eggs in one basket, so to speak. Um, yeah, I'd be happy to sort of send some, some links to some papers that are exploring that on the biodiversity side. Um, I think a really interesting area and something that I'm starting to look at now is whether those kinds of mixed mosaic landscapes also provide benefits for human health, for example, through increased dietary diversity locally. Um, I don't know the answer to that question. Okay, so then uh, I'll take another question to Julia. Uh, there's a question about uh, the funding of the methods you uh, talked about. So um, how can the negative emission technologies be financed and to which degree are they being used? So the, yeah. <laughs> Thanks. Um, to which degree are they being used? Not, not very much uh, yet. Of course, we've always been reforesting small patches without thinking of climate even already hundreds of years ago. But now we're really moving to a different scale of what would be needed to reach the Paris Agreement if we're not really, so even if we're even if we're, if we're decreasing fossil emissions massively, we still need these um, CDR to get to, to 1.5 degrees. Um, how is it financed? Well, um, taxpayers' money. So in, in the end, how you have to finance it back is via the CO2 price. And there, I'm um, also so, so on the chat, there's a question of, well, there's the, the issue of, of um, um, food security when you put all these biomass plantations everywhere. And, and it's the same, um, I think it can be answered with the same thing. If the CO2 price is high enough, you've got a big incentive in keeping forests standing or really putting forests back where it, where it used to be, or other types of natural vegetation that's carbon dense. Um, and the money that you create by that, because you're preventing climate damage, you save money and this money can go into intensification of the agriculture in a sustainable way. Like drip irrigation, like really high precision farming that's not using too much fertilizer, but just the right amount and so on. And so this could be refinanced. There's studies on that that show net you'd still gain a lot of money. And of course, for the entire climate um, issue, um, you also see that um, the damages would be much more expensive than, than taking these measures. It's just a way of how to present it to those who give the politicians their votes. Maybe I can also add something. I'm not an expert on agriculture, obviously, but from what I've like heard and read and so on, there are quite a lot of potentials for, especially for subsistence farmers in Sub-Saharan Africa and South Asia that have currently really very low yields on their farms and um, different um, agroecological methods can help them improve their yields, diversify their crops as well, which helps for health, for dietary diversity, as you mentioned, Chris, and also improve um, soil carbon storage and um, yeah, and biodiversity on, on the farms, etc. So there are quite a lot of these win-win strategies. I don't know how big they are in the picture of mitigation and so on. And like, for example, we've done a small study in Bangladesh on biochar urine fertilizer, but using crop residues for the biochar. So it was not competing with, with land for, for this. And that um, increase the vegetable yields in the gardens. And I put in the, in the question and answer thing, I put the link to the um, newest um, WBGU um, report on land use, which has kind of quite a focus on these multi-solving strategies and the potential for them. And actually, this will be the focus of lecture four. And uh, Karen Pittel, who is one of the lead authors of this report, will come in there to, to kind of talk about it. So we will have the whole lecture four is about land use. It's about nutrition. It's about kind of the report you're talking about. So we're coming back to this. Um, but it's really clear from both of you that in a way, the way we produce food and the way we eat has a huge impact. And uh, uh, it's one of the way we jointly can intervene. And this is a, a very clear area also very so clearly connected to health. Also what you were pointing out that we have a problem with food security. Now this might seem like just one issue, but it's already clear that in the global South millions of people are affected by it. So it's probably from a health perspective, one of the most traumatic effects we already have now because hunger has been going up again for many years, it has been going down. It's now going up again. We are not affected by it here, 
But in the global south, this is uh, millions of people who are affected, which then kind of is uh, uh, having an effect on securities and having, having an effect on migration movements and so on and so forth. So uh, it's, it's already a huge health topic. Yeah. Yeah, I think this lecture showed really well going from knowledge to transformative action from the local and the global level. So I, I really appreciated that. Um, that we have both things and talking about the local action, but also how we have big scale incentive systems that are just wired the wrong way. So I think it's a really good introduction that we had here. Anna, I think we can take one or two more questions. We don't have too much more time, but I think one or two more can we can manage and then we can have some closing statements and hand over to also preparing for our next lecture, please. Okay, thanks. Um, so there was a question about, um, well, often problems in land use are played off against um, growing populations um, and food security versus um, population. So um, we have seen that there are connections such as um, the animated map Julia showed um, and how it changed during Black Death. Um, but we've also seen solutions. So how to communicate about problematic aspects in land use um, and food security without pointing at growing populations as a major driver? Yeah, well, well first, um, no matter which social economic scenario you follow, the population growth will stagnate within the 21st century. So this is, this is really the, the um, a minor problem overall. It's about um, the lifestyle. Right, it's about in the case of land use, it's all about dietary changes, also a bit about waste. So about one third um, of, of the food amount is wasted for different reasons um, in the different parts of the world. If we reduce that, if we then took out some of these high CO2, high greenhouse gas products, like, like for example, beef, we can change a whole lot just on the dietary side without even big restrictions um, that would really make a difference much more than, than the population change is about relevant there. It's really lifestyle, less population. But of course, so we, are, we, we, are, um, we need to feed the population and we're still not there yet. It's a distribution problem worldwide. We, we are aware of that. It's not, it's not the amount that we're growing. Um, but also this can, can and has to be uh, made more efficient. And those scenarios, I showed you those 1.5 degree pathways that we could choose, um, those that um, have really reduced the energy demand. They built on international collaboration. And part of that is also that we collaborate more in the, in the food sector, grow stuff where it's most efficient to grow, make sure nothing's wasted, make sure everyone's equally fed and not overfed and underfed. And so this is the other key issues and not, not the amount, not the number of, of people in itself. Yes, thanks. Then maybe one last question to Chris. Um, which are, in your opinion, the most promising solutions to increase biodiversity? Um. I mean, I, I can't go past just increasing the, the, the amount of natural habitat, you know, good quality natural habitat that's there. I don't think reforestation with monocultures is, 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 is a good idea for biodiversity, although maybe it's better than not having any reforestation at all. Um, probably by far and away, the best thing we can do is preserve what is left. So there's quite a, a, a big movement within the biodiversity conservation community to, for example, preserve half Earth or 30% Earth or whatever. Um, that the main mechanism for that is through protected area network. So increasing the total coverage of the planet um, that is, you know, provides strong protection for biodiversity is is really really important. I agree that that needs to go up. Um, but also, I think, you know, trying to resolve some of the, the, the conflict from a scientific perspective, part of it is about trying to, trying to find alternatives to, to reduce the conflicts that people have with biodiversity so that you can get what we need um, without necessarily, um, you know, stomping on our, you know, on our biodiversity at the same time. So that's exactly what we talked about before. How do you produce food effectively? um you know to, to to feed the world but also to to preserve the planet so yeah i think that i think those food the food system is clearly critical given the area of the earth that is covered by agricultural lands with biodiversity you can kind of think of biodiversity loss as being almost direct, directly proportional through the species area relationship to the total uh, the total area that is lost from of, of native um native habitat um so it's very much about those major land cover classes and making sure that they're more biodiversity friendly than they are now. 
Thank you very much, Chris. Um, kind of to the end, uh, I think what both your presentations were showing very clearly is a need for disciplinary, cross-disciplinary cooperation, and also for the willingness to dive into the complexity without having easy answers. At the same time, there is a danger when you really dive into all of it, and we all need to be willing to do that, that you get lost and that you kind of are paralyzed by the immensity of the challenges. So on the other side, when I now look at it from a transformative action expert, kind of it's really important to have an idea of how things could change. Because if we don't have a vision of what is possible, not necessarily that it will come as we imagine, but if we not, don't have an idea that things could improve, we will be stuck. So perhaps any hints you can give us for what keeps you going, what is your idea of a, of a better or good life or of what is possible, that drives you. Julia, you want to start? I think you, we, we have to embrace the change that's happening. So we, there's no way of going back. It's not possible. It's probably also not a wise idea of going back to a natural state without humans. And we have to embrace the change and we have to use all the knowledge that, that we have to identify these win-win situations between humans and natural ecosystems across the scales, across the different um, disciplines. And we really have a, a, this mandate to manage wisely, so stewardship for the ecosystems. And when it comes to, to climate, it's in our very own interest to really do all this, this management in a very wise way. And I think making these this scientific, these research results apply, this is what, what drives me, <laughs> what, um, keeps me awake at night, but in a very good sense, because I think there's still a lot that can be put out for, for good usage really out, out in, the, in the individual countries, out in the fields. Thank you very much, Julia, for your contribution, for your presentation, and also for being a partner in this game. I know we will continue to cooperate. Chris, over to you. Um, yeah, I, I, so half of me, 50%, I think, agree exactly with what, what, what Julia said. The other 50% is in that paralysis state that staying up at night, feeling anxious about the, the state of the trajectory of the, of the world. One thing that I think has really shifted my mindset is, the, is moving more and more into the human health world where I see a larger potential to influence change um, for the better through that human health lens just because people are selfish and people will always think about themselves before they think about the rest of the world on average. And so it's necessary that we mobilise that health that health lever in order to derive benefits like julia says it's good for us to do this stuff it's just not obvious a lot of the time so trying to find a way where that becomes you know more you know more effectively communicated and 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 more effective you know overall is is really this i think the big challenge and what keeps me going um but yeah i have to be honest i i've spent a long a long time um feeling pretty miserable about the trajectory of some of this stuff and and um, you know I kind of also I flip flop between positive state and negative state but, you know <laughs> I'm not sure if that keeps me going or or not but um, but I think know. we all do we all have the days when it looks more difficult but perhaps to summarize what both of you are saying is really embrace the change but also be aware as health professional as the health sector can be a game changer because we can tell the narrative in a way by understanding what is going on to our patients, to ourselves, to the policymakers that probably no other profession can do. So I think it's really important to see that and also to, to understand that until very recently, our field was not established as a key field. So we are there kind of to make a, a difference. And this is an invitation to all who are listening now to participate in this. It means to dive into also the miserable things and the difficulties and the days when you are more paralyzed. But uh, uh, I think all together we are really starting to embrace the change and finding ways creatively to move things forward. And uh, this is also part of the partnership we are building across the planet. Sabine, any things you want to say at the end for today? Well, thank you. Um, yeah, maybe because I also saw this question, what do you think is the biggest hurdle and so on? So and I was thinking maybe one hurdle is this illusion that we are separate from nature <laughs> and that one of the solutions lies in being more humble and realizing that we 
humans share this beautiful planet with all these many other species that they're not a pile of resources for us and that we're part of that complex web of life and also totally depend on it for our health and everything and that that we like and there's been so many crises on this planet if you think back the history of the planet so this is another one of this conscious mammal that kind of wreaks havoc and how do we now organize ourselves in a more intelligent way and find indicators of progress that really measure well-being and not something else and how do we protect our common goods against the interests of some few people who may benefit against the interest of most of the biosphere and most humans as well I think but but then I, I kind of believe in that people also have that knowledge inside them and a lot of energy to, to work for the better of everybody. And, and seeing that so many people participate and are get engaged, it makes me hopeful that we're, we have a chance still <laughs> to turn the tide. Thank you very much. So I'm handing over to Sophie to make the final announcement also for the next lecture. Yeah, thank you very much. Um, we now come to the close of the first lecture um, and we meet again kind of same place same time next week for an introduction to planetary health uh, with Ian Hamilton and Claudia Treidel Hoffmann and if you liked the today we would love to welcome you again next week and maybe you can bring a friend um, and we will continue the discussion and until then I wish you a lovely week. <laughs>